To the lover of pure wilderness, Alaska is one of the most wonderful countries in the world. No excursion that I know of may be made into any other American wilderness where so marvelous an abundance of noble newborn scenery is so charmingly brought into view as on a trip through the Alexander Archipelago. At least that's what John Muir said after his first trip in 1879. And while traveling on a modern cruise ship is a vastly different experience from a steamer nearly 150 years ago, the wildlife, the scenery, and the remote nature of the place remains the draw just the same. What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to the channel. I had the opportunity to go on another Alaskan cruise this year and with that I wanted to update my Alaska cruise camera gear guide. It's been almost five years since the last time I was on elapsed, uh, an Alaskan cruise and honestly in that time some things have changed. At least a little. And at least on the camera gear side of things. Now, before I get to the gear, I want to give you some context of what we're talking about here. So this will be my fourth Alaskan cruise, all of which have been with Norwegian Cruise Line. In other words, we are talking about vacation cruises here, not expedition cruises. Moreover, while I consider myself a serious photographer, whatever that's supposed to mean anymore, for a cruise like this, my aim has increasingly shifted towards having just enough gear to get good shots while still enjoying the experience as a whole. I don't see this as a photographic expedition to Alaska. It's a cruise in a beautiful place that offers a lot of opportunities to make images. So in that vein, I'm going to talk a lot about the reasoning behind the gear I take, and my hope here is that this will help you figure out how to make what you already have work best for you, or decisions about the gear that you have or might want to get in your own context. Now, with that said, a lot of what can make a good experience a great one is the choice of ship and excursions you go on. Now, unlike most cruises, Alaska, an Alaska cruise comes with a constantly changing view of nearly pristine mountains, glaciers, waterfalls, and wildlife. You're not stuck out at sea looking at nothing. And a great deal of time can simply be spent sitting on your balcony or one of the sun decks with a camera finding images in that ever-changing landscape. However, part of that experience does depend on the ship you're sailing on. Now, when I went on my first Alaskan cruise almost a decade ago, there weren't any 4,000 passenger ships plying the waters. Now those ships have kind of become the norm. And having been on both the smaller and larger versions of cruise ships out there, my preference actually lies with the smaller ones. Now, of course, some of this has to do with crowds, both on the ships and in the ports that you visit. But I've also found that the photography just didn't feel like it was as good from the larger ships with their decks so much higher above the water, the landscape, and the action. Now, on top of that, many of these newer ships also have plexiglass windscreens around parts of their open decks. This is especially true towards the bow. And, of course, shooting through plexiglass, even if it's not scratched, is not necessarily ideal for your images. Now, that said, there are always places to shoot from, including your stateroom's balcony if you have one. But it is something to keep in mind if you are planning one of these trips. Now, the other part of the experience is getting off of the ship and doing some excursions. And to this, I want to at least temper some expectations. Even if an excursion is marketed as a photo tour, don't expect something targeted at that nebulous, serious photographer level. The reality is, is that there will be people with just a smartphone, and the tour operators aren't going to leave them hanging at least insofar as they can, but it's really hard to shoot whales and bears with a smartphone. Now, anything that, uh, another thing to pay attention with your excursions is how much they try to pack in. If you're looking for photographic opportunities, you don't necessarily need to be on a photo tour. In fact, most of the stuff that I've shot in Alaska wasn't on photo tours. But you do want to look for things that focus on one or two activities over a reasonable length of time, and not ones that try to include everything, including the kitchen sink, in an hour to keep up with the ADHD-rattled population. Now, one other thing that I might recommend for looking at with excursions is those that aren't directly affiliated with your ship and cruise line, so third-party ones, if you will. I found these excursions tend to have smaller groups on a whole, and depending on the time of year and the port of call can be significantly less crowded than the same kind of thing that's offered through your ship. 
On one of these wildlife viewing excursions that I did out of Skagway, I ended up being the only person on it, which, needless to say, was great for not having to rush along to appease a crowded bus of bored tourists. Okay, so enough about the cruise, let's talk about the gear. Now, on my first trip, I massively overpacked. I had two cameras and more lenses than I knew what to do with or could actually even use. What I learned from that trip was you just want to take enough gear to cover your needs and no more. Extra gear is extra weight and extra worry. Now, of course, if you've never been on an Alaskan cruise, how do you know what you need to take? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's start with the camera. Now, the good news here is that it's not 2005 or even 2015 anymore tech has progressed to the point that even an entry-level camera can do pretty much everything you need. In fact, it's hard for me to point to a specific feature like autofocus performance or frame rate or something like that that you need to prioritize when choosing a camera anymore. Modern cameras are just so capable across the board that basically everything that you need it to do can be done handily by even compact cameras, never mind entry-level interchangeable lens ones. Now that said, one question I have seen somewhat regularly is, do I need a full frame camera or is crop just fine? And the answer to that is crop is perfectly fine. In fact, it's even advantageous in some ways. Now, yes, there are technical advantages to full frame cameras. Specifically, they tend to have better dynamic range and because they're higher up the food chain, sometimes better features. But here's the truth. In the vast majority of cases, unless you are in the top 1% of photographers, that difference matters far less than the photo influencers and marketers, camera manufacturers would like you to believe. Now on the flip side, crop cameras score huge wins when it comes to weight and size. Their smaller sensors can use smaller lenses to get the same angles of view, and that means less overall weight. This makes it much easier to take a camera and go do something interesting, and that's probably where you're going to get the interesting pictures. This is especially true with excursions that have size, weight, or complete baggage restrictions. You might run into these on a float plane or helicopter tour. In my experience, helicopter tours will not let you take anything that you can't carry. Now remember, all the stats and capabilities in the world don't matter if you didn't bring the camera along in the first place. Now, another big point that I have struggled with, at least personally, is should you take two cameras if you have them, or is one more than enough? Now, on my first three trips, I took two cameras every time, and my reasoning for this was actually really simple. It's expensive to go to Alaska and take a cruise. And if I have two cameras with me and one of them breaks, yes, I'm going to be upset about the camera break and I'm going to worry about how much it's going to cost to get it fixed and all of that kind of thing. But at least I can keep shooting while I'm finishing off the cruise. Now with only one camera, not only are you stuck with the dead camera, but you also are done with your ability to take pictures for the rest of that trip as well. This time I'm only taking one camera and I'm still not completely comfortable with doing that, but my second body is an R5C and I will talk about why I'm not taking that in just a moment. Now, of course, I have and have had the cameras to do this. I didn't have to go out and buy or rent something to get there. And as a result, I don't see this as a necessity. It is certainly a nice thing to have if you do have the gear, but you don't need to run out and buy another camera or rent a new camera for a cruise like this. If it was an expedition cruise or something to that effect, then I would probably say that might be more important. Now, if you were considering upgrading already and we're going to buy a camera, this whole trip was an impetus for you to do that. In that case, I would probably try to take both cameras and you know, use my new camera as my primary, take my old camera along as a backup and go for like, go for it that way. Assuming of course, that I hadn't sold my old camera yet to buy the new one. So with all that said, what really matters when it comes to cameras on an Alaskan cruise then? So what I've found matters most isn't actually the camera, it's you and your familiarity with, familiarity with using your camera. You want to be able to make at least basic adjustments to settings like exposure and focus precision nearly effortlessly. 
Whether you're shooting the landscapes from a ship as they pass by, or you're shooting bears, whales, or other wildlife on an excursion, being able to quickly raise, point your camera, make an adjustment, compose, focus, and shoot the image without fumbling is a valuable thing to have. This is especially true in my experience when it comes to whale watching and photographing the whales on those types of excursions. With regular wildlife photography, you're always playing catch up with the animal as a photographer. It knows what it's gonna do and you just react to whatever it's doing. But at least you can see them and so you can either get clues or you can just keep the camera pointed on them. With whales, the first time you know something is happening is basically when you want to start shooting except you don't know where they are because they're underwater until that first moment happens. For example, this is a shot of a humpback whale feeding 50 feet from the docks in Icy Strait Point. Now what mattered here wasn't frame rate, sensor size, dynamic range, or any of that kind of stuff, but just getting my camera on target, focused, and shooting as quick as I absolutely could. And quite honestly, even with my familiarity with my camera, it was still a struggle to get the camera up fast enough. And I talked about the picture, this picture and the story behind it in a previous video, along with some tips about whale watching in general that might be useful if you plan on doing that. I will put a link to it in the usual places so you can check that out. So what am I taking this time? Well, simple. It's, I'm taking my EOS R5. I already said this, I think. It's the camera I have used and am most comfortable with operating. Now that said, if you're looking to replace your camera with something new, I would strongly recommend doing that far, in far enough in advance of your trip that you can spend some time getting comfortable with your new camera before you go. Take it to a zoo or a park or whatever and just shoot some stuff. Now, as I said in the past, I've also taken a second body, but I'm not doing that this time. Right now, my second body is an EOS R5C. And as good of a camera as it is, it has one killer weakness that's prompting me to leave it home. And the reason that it's, the reason for that is, or that killer weakness is the absolute complete lack of any kind of weather sealing, coupled with Southeast Alaska's notoriously rainy conditions. Now that said, don't want, let this scare you off. If your camera isn't weather sealed, don't let you that stop you from taking it. First of all, most cameras are far more weather resistant than people believe, even when they're not marketed as such. More importantly, and this is specifically dealing with my R5C, most cameras don't have big vents cut in them for active cooling, something that the R5C does. Even then, the answer is, isn't necessarily to leave your camera at home, it's to get a rain cover for your camera, and I'll talk about them in more in a moment. Now, along with my R5, I also am taking a GoPro. Personally, or primarily, I use it to shoot a time lapse out my stateroom's window, using a suction cup mount to stick it to the glass. Now, if you do this, you'll also want a power adapter, probably an external USB battery pack, and a long USB cable to keep this camera running. If you've never been on a cruise before, something you should be aware of is that when you leave your cabin, you will turn the power off to your room. And that is a fire safety measure that cruise ships have implemented to ensure that, you know, a thing in the charger doesn't catch fire while no one's there to see it. What this also means is that if you're running your GoPro in time-lapse mode off of a power adapter plugged into the wall, approximately when you walk out of the room or thereabouts and turn the power off, the camera is going to switch to its internal battery. And then about two hours or so after that, it's going to power off because it's running out of battery power. So if you are doing this and you are planning to go out of your room for longer than two hours, you will probably want a USB battery pack to keep your action camera running to shoot the time-lapse. Now, if this does sound like something you want to do, here are a couple more tips for this process. First, do everything you can to minimize any reflections that the camera can see in the window. Turn off the front recording light and the front display. Get the lens as close to the window as possible. In fact, if you can, clean the window on both sides, especially if you have a balcony. Put the entire setup behind your room's curtains or cover it with a black cloth to prevent room light from reflecting into the lens during the sunrise and sunset time periods. 
Now for settings, I use the highest resolution I can with the widest angle of view that doesn't include much of the ship. My idea is I want to see landscapes. I don't want to see a handrail and a roof. On top of that, I set the interval to one half of a second. This is the fastest option on the GoPro. This turns a 24 hour day into two hours of video played back at 24 frames per second. And while you can use a longer interval, I prefer to speed things up in post if I want to, when I deal with the footage later, instead of shooting fewer frames because you will have the option or opportunity to potentially miss things doing that. Now, of course, the other use for an action camera or a smartphone for that matter is to take on those more adventurous excursions, the rafting or whatever that are too risky for you to take your main camera. And speaking of smartphones, while a smartphone is not a replacement for a proper camera, even though Apple's marketing still says that it is, it is still an incredibly useful tool to have, especially when the choice is between it and no camera at all. Now that said, if you are using your phone for video or an action camera for that matter, do consider getting some neutral density filters for it. This is especially important if you shoot at 24 or 25 frames per second, where the lack of motion blur caused by the fast shutter speeds that are needed to control the exposure during the day can make the footage look jittery or stuttery. You can mitigate this to some extent by shooting at 60 frames per second, but either way, you're not going to get a very cinematic look with a fast shutter speed regardless of the frame rate. Right after cameras comes lenses. And I was gonna to try to cut this down a bit, but the reality is, is that if you're shooting with an interchangeable lens camera, the lenses are kind of the point. And honestly, there's a lot to talk about here. After taking way too much gear on my first trip, specifically in the form of lenses, I realized you don't need an entire bag of glass on a cruise like this. What you need is just enough glass to cover the situations that you're likely to be in. And when it comes to an Alaskan cruise, for me, that's really just two major situations, wildlife and everything else. Now, for everything that isn't wildlife, a mid-range general purpose zoom will do the job. On a full frame camera, that would be something like a 24 to 70 or 24 to 120 range lens. A super zoom like a 24 to 240 or 24 to 300 would also work if that's what you have, but that will probably be a little bit short for you on the telephoto end of things. Now, what I found really isn't that useful are fast primes and ultra wide angle lenses. Lenses like a 50 f 1.2 or a 15 to 35 or something even wider than that. Primes really aren't flexible, which means that you end up needing to have more gear to cover the gaps. And in my experience, you just don't need the speed. Blurring out backgrounds in Alaska is not what you want to do. You actually kind of want to include them because it's half of the point if you're going to Alaska. Now, as for ultra wides, I have found that I either run up to two situations with these. One is I end up cropping out two thirds of the image to get rid of empty sky or clouds and empty ocean, just to have the mountains that make the good landscape. The alternative is like when I'm on shore, I just plain struggle to find interesting subjects where the extreme angle of view really adds anything over shooting the same thing with like a 24 millimeter lens. So that brings us to the other part, the wildlife and choosing a telephoto lens. Now I use mine for two things specifically shooting wildlife and shooting landscapes from the ship. Now, for the landscapes, I either shoot handheld panos at around 100 millimeters, or I use the zoom to punch in and isolate details like waterfalls, icebergs, lighthouses, interesting buildings along the shore, and other things like that. Now, as for wildlife, the primary subjects are bears, whales, and other marine or other marine mammals and birds. Now for these reach is certainly important, but at least in the case of whales, I've also run into situations where not having enough reach is also a problem. And this is kind of tempered how I look at things. Now, of course, one answer to the lens question here is you take what you have and you make do. And if that's a 150 to 500 or a 200 to 600, then so be it, it's what you have. And don't get me wrong, those will absolutely work fine. However, if you're considering a new telephoto lens or you already have some options in your bag and you're wondering what you might want to take, what I've found in the process of trying things is this. 
uh, to start with, there is a size, weight, and flexibility uh, consideration. Because of this, as I already said, I prefer zooms over primes. And while a Super Telephoto Prime can absolutely deliver better image quality than a Super Telephoto Zoom, it also is big, heavy, and inflexible. When it comes to focal ranges, changing lenses is slow. And, you know, while I'm more than willing to take a couple of complete rigs with intermeshed lenses and all of that kind of jazz to somewhere like Yellowstone or Africa or the Galapagos or shoot polar bears or whatever, uh, on a cruise like this, I'd really rather not. I also want something that gets reasonably close to 100 millimeters. Again, partly for those shipborne landscapes and partly because of that overly tight whale shot that was a once in a life opportunity that I nearly missed and you could say has scarred me for life. So I like a lens that falls in the 100 to 400 or 100 to 500 millimeter range on a full frame camera. Now, while something longer, for example, Canon's 200 to 800, Nikon's 200 to 500, or Sony's 200 to 600 will certainly work and they are absolutely fantastic lenses, I'm not pers personally comfortable with the lack of coverage at the wide end. Now, of course, sure, you can cover that with a 7200, but now we're talking about more gear again, and that's part of the thing I'm trying to avoid as well. Now, the other option here are lenses like the Sigma and Tamron 150 to 500 or 150 to 600. And honestly, I think these are a much better option than a 200 to something, but uh, I'd still do prefer being able to go wider than 150 if I can. Now, this brings me to teleconverters. In my last video, I said I take one as cheap insurance for those situations where I need just a little more reach out of my lens. However, with my current R5 and 100 to 500 setup, I'm actually leaving mine at home, partly due to very specific reasons with that lens and partly due to what I'm about to talk about. Now, while teleconverters can be extremely useful, they are not a perfect solution to the problem either. And whether you should consider using one depends on a myriad of factors. The two biggest factors that I would say to start with are gonna be compatibility and image quality. Not all lenses are compatible with a teleconverter. This is especially true if you're using a super zoom. So you simply might not have the option at all, in which case there's no point in worrying about it. Now, as far as image quality goes, teleconverters are basically magnifying lenses. In other words, they will magnify the image from the lens that they're mounted on. And, and this includes the lens's optical aberrations. Using a teleconverter on a cheap lens just does not produce good results. On top of that, teleconverters are lenses in their own right. And a low quality teleconverter can introduce all kinds of new aberrations to ruin the image quality on its own, regardless of what the lens does. On top of all of that, both camera and AI-driven upscaling software have also changed the calculus here too. Modern cameras are much higher resolution than they were in the past. And this becomes relevant because of diffraction. So a 45 megapixel full frame camera is diffraction limited at f7.1 and a 32 megapixel APS-C camera will be diffraction limited around f5.6, depending on the exact crop factor. This means that images that are made with an aperture slower than that, so for example, f8, will start to be softened and will be softened increasingly so as you stop down further by the effects of diffraction. And yes, Technically, there's diffraction correction optimizations and stuff like that that can help and they can work really well in some cases. But if you can avoid it in the first place, it's usually better. Now, when you add a teleconverter, you are also going to slow the aperture of your lens. A 1.4x teleconverter reduces the aperture by a stop and a 2x teleconverter reduces it by two stops. This will make your f5.6 lens into an f8 or f11 lens, which is going to be potentially problematic. Now, on top of that, as I said, there's now really good AI-driven software upscaling that can often produce really good results, better than what you would get out of the camera and lens, especially when you start talking about using middle or lower quality lenses, 
where, especially if you put a teleconverter on them, where the, the computer can just upscale things and make it look better than what you would get from using that lens with a teleconverter. So ultimately these days, I find teleconverters aren't something I recommend in general anymore. For me, they now fall into the category of things where if you know you need one, you know enough about what you're doing that you don't need me to tell you to get one. Which brings me to what I'm taking. It's just two lenses. This time I'm taking an RF 24 to 70 millimeter F 2.8 L IS USM and an RF 100 to 500 F 4.5 to 7.1 L IS USM. So that takes care of the big stuff. What about the little stuff? And let's start with some stuff that I already mentioned, like camera rain gear. The short of it is Southeast Alaska is rainy. The entire area is a temperate rainforest that receives on average 118 or about three meters of rain per year. The town of Ketchikan specifically can receive about 140 to 160 inches of rain a year, or 3.56 uh, to 4.1 meters. Moreover, it's not like it rains hard, it just rains all of the time, with over 220 days of the year seeing rain. Now, while having a weather-resistant body and lens is great, I also prefer a defense and depth approach. And this means a rain cover for my camera and a poncho for me. Now, as an aside, even if you have good rain jackets and pants, I absolutely love to have a poncho with me when I'm out in the field. I find it an invaluable way to very quickly cover up not only myself, but my camera and my backpack and anything else that's on me at basically the flip of a piece of cloth. Now for camera specific rain covers, I have two. Both of them are from Think Tank. One is Think Tank's Hydrophobia 70 to 200, and the other is their medium sized emergency rain cover. Why two? Well, Part of that has to do with Canon changing their viewfinders on their mirrorless cameras to not have separate eye cups. And part of that has to do with the fact that they serve subtly different purposes and do their jobs slightly differently. The Hydrophobia is designed with a neoprene gasket where the eyepiece goes that lets you use either a replacement eye cup, which is what you'll want to do for most cameras, unless it's a Canon mirrorless that's not an R3, uh, but for the R5, at least, and other Canon mirrorless cameras where the eye or the viewfinder projects out over the back of the camera, you can just stretch that neoprene fabric out over the viewfinder. The idea here is that you can continue shooting using the viewfinder while it's raining and using this rain cover. Now, on the other hand, while the emergency rain cover does let you work with the rear LCD to shoot, it's quite honestly not as comfortable uh, to use for long periods of time when you're out working in the rain. That said, it's lighter weight and it's way faster and easier to put on your camera. Now, I'm taking both and I'm pl my plan is to choose whichever makes more sense based on the situation. If I wanna stand out in the rain and shoot, which I actually seem to do quite a lot, I'll use the hydrophobia. If the rain is, or if there isn't rain expected, then I will take the emergency rain cover along as a added protection if I need it. I also mentioned neutral density filters earlier uh, for specifically for shooting video on a smartphone or action camera. Well, quite honestly, the same also applies to your regular camera as well. When shooting video to maintain a smooth appearance of motion, you need to ensure that there is some motion blur. Now, the standard for this in the cinematic world is to use a 180 degree shutter angle or an exposure time that's one half of the frame time or an exposure time that's one over twice the frame rate. However, saying that or phrasing that makes sense to you. What you don't want to do is have your camera shooting at one two thousandth or one eight thousandth of a second. Now, smartphones have a problem because they have fixed aperture lenses and that leaves them only the ISO and the shutter or two speed to control the exposure and ISOs don't go much lower than 50 on them. On a normal camera, we at least have the option to step the, stop the lens down, which helps but if your camera is say shooting in log and has to have a base ISO of 800, it's not gonna help that much. And therefore there's still a lot of times where you're gonna want to use some neutral density to manage the exposure and keep your shutter speeds low. 
Now for these, I use Peter McKinnon or Polar Pro's Peter McKinnon variable neutral density filters. Uh, I have both the two and a, two to five and six to nine stop versions, and I find they work very well. Uh, however, the reality is, is you can use pretty much any variable neutral density filter or fixed neutral density filter that is out there. I'm also taking a circular polarizer. These are great to cut glare off of ice, water, and leaves. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to use it, but like the neutral density filters, it's comparatively very small and light. I already have one, and so I'm taking it as a just-in-case measure. Something else you might want to think about are camera supports. In the past, I have taken tripods and monopods, and in general, I don't really find there's a lot of use for them on a cruise. The boat moves, so you're not going to be able to put the camera on a tripod and then shoot a long exposure and hope that it isn't going to be blurry. About the only place where I found they make sense is you could set up a tripod, for example, on your balcony so that you can keep your camera pointed in a ready-to-shoot position out at the world around you, hoping that something happens, and you don't have to stand there and keep holding it. That said, a monopod works here as well, at least to a certain extent, but you still have to put it down. At least it does carry the weight of your camera instead of you having to constantly hold it, which after a couple of hours can get pretty tiring. That said, I don't, I'm not taking either on this cruise. I am going to run the whole thing handheld because I don't want the extra weight. I'm also going to try out something new on this trip, and that is a Peak Design Capture Camera Carrying thing. If you're not familiar with it, it's their holster quick release thing that mounts to a belt or a backpack strap and provides a really secure but easy to release way to carry your camera like on your shoulder or something like that. I think it might be useful on some of the excursions that I'm going on and not necessarily just have the camera flopping around on a camera strap. Now for power, I have found from past experience that I can work just fine with two sets of two batteries. I have a battery grip on my camera, that's why the, I use the batteries in pairs. On previous trips where I've done this, I've been able to go for at least a couple of days of shooting without the need to recharge, so if I recharge every night, I should be more than fine. Now that said, with the ability to recharge batteries in my R5, albeit slowly, I am planning on leaving my chargers at home this time. Maybe this is a bad idea, maybe it's not, but while the camera isn't as fast as a standalone charger, I do have two pairs of batteries if that becomes a thing, and there's really almost always going to be time to get some charging in during the day, and especially over the course of the night while you're sleeping. So that's what I'm taking on my next Alaska cruise, and why. I hope I found enough or you found some useful ideas and information in there. If you did and you found this in or you found this interesting, let me know by hitting that like button and sharing this. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Finally, if you'd like to support this channel and future content like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can or buying something yourself, something you've always wanted from one of the affiliate links in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.